Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the webcast, The Future Workforce, The Gig Economy and the Challenges of Addressing a Contingent Workforce, sponsored by ePay Systems. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that this webcast has been pre-approved for HRCI and SHRM credit. You will receive an email from HR.com within two business days, which will include the certification credit information. You may also log into HR.com and go to your View My Credits page, where you can find all the credits you have received with us. If you have any questions today, please type them into the questions tab on your GoToWebinar control panel. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over today to our webinar host, Brittany. Brittany, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, The Future Workforce, The Gig Economy and the Challenges of a Contingent Workforce, presented by ePay Systems and Cypher Shaw. My name is Brittany Kowalczyk, and I am the Director of Marketing here at ePay. Um, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you on the line with us today. Thank you for sharing some of your very busy day with us and joining our webinar. We know that your schedule is jam-packed, so we'll try to make the most of your time. First, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Kevin Young is a partner at Cypher Shaw in the Labor and Employment Department and a member of the Wage and Hour Litigation Practice Group. He practiced, his practice includes defending employers in class and collective action lawsuits, representing clients facing agency investigations, and providing preventative counseling on a range of employment issues with an emphasis on wage and hour compliance. Kevin represents businesses facing investigation or audit by the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division, its state law counterparts, or the U.S. Department of Justice. Welcome, Kevin. We also have Simon Yang, who is a senior associate at Cypher Shop. As a member of the Labor and Employment Department, he represents employers in all aspects, all aspects of labor and employment litigation, including discrimination, harassment, wrongful termination, retaliation, wage and hour, business torts, and class action matters. Prior to becoming an attorney, Simon developed a well-balanced perspective to labor and employment issues. In addition to postgraduate study in labor and industrial relations, Simon has prior work experience in human resources and for the National Labor Relations Board. Welcome, Simon. Let me quickly go over a little bit about ePay Systems. While you might not be intimately familiar with ePay Systems, we've been in business serving clients since 2001. We offer a complete end-to-end -end human capital management solution, which includes applicant tracking, onboarding, benefits admin, time and labor management, payroll and tax management, and performance management. We've built our solution to serve clients with a distributed workforce. In fact, our system is deployed at over 75,000 work sites across the globe. We've always been SaaS, allowing our customers to benefit from quarterly enhancements no client IT footprint, and the flexibility of a cloud solution. We're able to retain our clients at a 99% retention rate due to our free premium customer support. Our clients work around the clock and we're available to them when they need, 24-7, 365. Your employees can even call us instead of calling you to troubleshoot. So that's a little bit about ePay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin and Simon and they're going to walk you through the rest of the presentation. Kevin and Simon? Thank you so much, Brittany, and thank you all of, uh, to, to everybody who's joined us for this afternoon. Uh, this is a topic that is really near and dear to both my heart and to Simon's, uh, talking about and looking at the evolution of the workplace, particularly in the gig economy, and what kinds of challenges and opportunities that's creating for employers and employees alike. It's a topic that we've focused on a lot over the past couple years, and it's a topic that we expect to give uh, both both headaches and also opportunities to employers who are looking at how they fit into this new uh, area of the uh, employment workspace. Before we go further, uh, we, we, we have to say this, you know, lawyers are cautious people and the cautious thing to do is to make clear to everybody on the call that nothing that we say today is intended to, uh, to be or be construed as legal advice for any particular issue. Likewise, we're not uh, attempting to and, and shouldn't be construed as attributing opinions, particularly political opinions, uh, to CIFAR, to HR.com, or to, to ePay uh, with, with anything that we're talking about today. 
there will be a window to ask questions. And I think, in fact, you can ask questions as we go uh, throughout today's presentation. And we'd love for you to do so. Uh, we'll, we'll take them as we can or, or at the end, whichever one ends up working better. But we'll certainly try to get to all of them. One thing that, that is really important when you ask the questions, which we hope you do, is that we really don't want to get into a situation where we're providing advice on a specific issue or a specific employee or something that's come up where it could look like legal advice. Two really important words to avoid that sort of thing are hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically speaking are some of our favorite words in a presentation like this. Uh, but, but nevertheless, this is a topic that we've studied about a lot, that we've been focusing on a lot, and we are really excited to talk to you about it today. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Okay, so we wanted to give a, a brief overview of, of where the discussion is going to be going today. We're going to start by looking at some macro level trends that we've all been seeing and hearing about, not just lawyers, but, but throughout the, the uh, business space and in our economy. We've been hearing a lot about automation. We've been hearing a lot about tech-driven innovation. And we've been hearing about the rise of the gig economy. From an employment law perspective, we're going to hone in really today on the gig economy. As so many people know by now, this is an area of the workforce that simply isn't well accounted for by current laws at the federal level or really any level below it. We have so many employment laws that were drafted and contemplated at a much different time for a much different workforce than exists and is growing today. That's going to lead us, looking at the gig economy will lead us to the meat of the presentation which is to look at what risks employers participating in the gig economy are facing, what legal developments we're seeing that might offer some semblance of clarity to help navigate those risks, and also where we think and, and where it looks like things are heading from a legal perspective. As I mentioned before, if you have questions, please, please feel free to raise them as we go throughout the presentation, and we'll do our best to get to them either as we go or at the end of the presentation today. All right. so. What in the world are we talking about? Um, we, we hear the term gig economy, as Kevin mentioned, uh, uh, over and over in the media. But uh, as we all know, technology today is moving at a faster clip than ever before. And I think by now, we've all come to accept that, uh, for example, that internet thing is probably more than a fad and uh, is it, here to stay. But uh, all around us, when we look at the workplace, we see that technology is uh, not only going to change, but already changing uh, a lot of workplace norms uh, that we've become accustomed to. Just as an example at the impact technology is having, not only in the workplace, but just in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, it was just 14 years ago that uh, economists from Harvard and MIT wrote that driverless cars couldn't execute a left turn against traffic because there'd be too many variables uh, involved. Uh, of course, only six years ago. After that, Google proved it could make fully autonomous cars, uh, which now are starting to threaten the jobs of millions of truck and taxi drivers. Uh, fast forwarding to today, uh, just earlier this year, Google had announced uh, pretty remarkable plans for the automated conversation it, it plans for its assistant platform to be able to complete in just a short time. Uh, the examples in their presentation included uh, you know, booking a hair appointment at a certain time uh, upon which that instruction Google Assistant would be able to call and conduct phone calls with humans on the other end to uh, accomplish tasks. Um, but while we all hear that media discuss certain technolo technological advances and the oncoming wave of robots, uh, and most people acknowledge that uh, there will be an impact on the workplace, uh, it's surprising that most nonetheless believe that their jobs will remain unchanged. Uh, depending on who you ask, what that impact is going to be is more up for debate, debate but uh, Kevin's going to get into uh, the difference between potential impacts on uh, workplace tasks versus entire jobs. But while there is some disagreement on the impact that technology, robots, and automation will have on the workplace, uh, one thing that seems pretty certain is that uh, the workplace is changing. Um, other factors come into play. Uh, we, we may have also heard the term uh, 
retail apocalypse as uh, more and more retail spaces are closing. Uh, I think Friday is the last day that Toys R Us is going to be in business in any brick and mortar location across the country. But uh, apart from that, in the changing times, there's a number of social factors at play, uh, including the in independent acceleration of retirement rates, um, just the changing uh, skill set that today's jobs are demanding, as well as generational changes that uh, we see at play uh, in studies on millennials who, for example, uh, seem to prefer freedom over profit. I'm going to throw it to Kevin to start discussing uh, what the debate currently is in terms of how automation is going to change the workplace. Kevin? Thanks, Simon. And we can go to the next slide for this one. Okay, so so certainly when we when we talk about the gig economy and and really the backdrop for these changes we're seeing in the workforce, you can't have that discussion without looking at the impact the technology is having on jobs and on the workplace. And one of the primary suspects that we talk about is automation. As Simon alluded to, a, a big discussion in this area is: Are we talking about automation of tasks or jobs? And that's not to suggest that there's one be-all and all answer for any given job or any given uh, industry. But it really is in looking at any particular job kind of you know, the right focus to have. You know, when we talk about automation, what are we talking about automation of? Some folks look at automation of tasks. Uh, you know, as, as displayed on the slide, there was a 2016 McKinsey study that found that out of over 800 jobs that were studied, only 5% or roughly that could be fully automated. But the vast majority of jobs in that study had some elements that could be automated. This goes even for you know, the C-suite folks who do plenty of high-level stuff, given you know, their type of role and what they're doing for the organization. But even those types have some aspects of the job that could be automated in some way, shape, or form. On the flip side, you, you, you have folks who say, well, gosh, you know, automation and robots is not just coming for certain tasks. It's coming for the jobs. And in certain areas, this may be true. There was a 2016 White House report that estimated that over 3 million drivers could lose jobs to automation due to fully autonomous vehicles. It's clear the workplace is changing. There's no question about that. But what kind of impact it's going to have and whether it's going to subsume jobs or just parts of jobs is something that, that remains to be seen. There, there's you know, this, this sort of debate and this sort of worry or focus is, is, is not new. Um, there's you know, a, a tale that is about 500 years old where Queen Elizabeth cited the same fear when she denied an inventor, an English inventor, a patent for an automated knitting device that was, her, you know, her concern was based on concern for poor women who earn their daily living by knitting. And she didn't want you know, their jobs to be taken away. Not a very surprise ending here. Innovation still happens. The lack of a patent didn't stop the factories from adopting the machine and, and, and the workplace evolved. But nevertheless, it's, it's still this kind of task versus, job, task versus job consideration that we look at in this sort of debate. You know, you could, looking at the task view, you know, it's job, not just the knitting machine that's a 500 year old tale. You could look at Amazon, which has increased the number of robots from about 1,400 to about 45,000. So, 40 times over in the past three years. And over that time, the hiring rate for Amazon that's reported hasn't changed. The hiring rate has stayed the same, even as this reliance on robots within that workforce has, has multiplied 40 times over in three years. The reality is that there are many jobs, just like McKenzie found, that cannot and probably should not be fully automated, but tasks within them can. And, you know, there's kind of a, a, a philosophical question about, you know, is that so bad? And, and I don't want to suggest that there's a right or wrong answer about that. But if you look at most jobs, you know, so many jobs in the workplace have elements of scheduling a meeting or submitting a receipt or checking for, for you know, grammar, you know, typographical errors. A lot of jobs do that. They weren't really hired to do that in the first place. And so automation of tasks like that might not be such a bad thing. But you know, in, 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 in looking at that, there's also questions about could it reduce labor costs 
while at the same time allowing workers to focus on higher level, more judgment heavy type of things, more fulfilling types of tasks. But nevertheless, there's also this question about, you know, are there just jobs like the trucker jobs that could just disappear? Really impacting big swaths of the workforce, at least in certain industries. You know, one interesting example, if nothing else, you know, I, I read, I think last week, the first automated burger joint opened up in San Francisco. And the, the article was touting these robots that make your burger. So you decide what you're going to put on it. it. It was touting that these robots have been programmed with Michelin star award-winning techniques, and they make this phenomenal burger, and it's all done by a robot. And so you look at it, you say, okay, well, fast food worker for that type of restaurant has gone. That, that's a big piece of the workforce, and it's gone. But the answer there is no, that, that, that yes, the person who flips the burger and assembles it you know, that's now automated, but what that joint has is they have what's called a burger consultant, and that that person's job is now to interact with the customer, talk about different you know makeups for a burger that they've tried, it might go well together, that sort of thing, and also to focus on the customer experience, soft sort of skills and 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 human centric sort of skills that a lot of folks would have this view that you know, either can't be automated or even if they could, maybe shouldn't, because it might reduce the customer experience. And maybe that's kind of the middle ground. It, it says, hey, well, some jobs are going away, but new jobs are gonna pop up, emphasizing different skills, that sort of thing. Again, there's no suggestion that, that, that it's gonna be one or the other. It probably depends on industry, depends on jobs, but this is really part of where the rubber hits the road and looking at where we stand right now, where we stick, See technology going and what it's going to do to the workplace and how it's going to impact it. Thanks, With Gavin. that, we can go. Yeah, I'll use that. Moving on, I think that one reason why it's very important to understand the distinction between tasks and jobs that Kevin was explaining uh, is putting that together with the concept that I had highlighted in the initial slide. While most people have no doubt that technology is coming to change the workplace. Most don't believe that their jobs are at risk. Looking at what the gig economy actually is with the understanding that there is a difference between the automation of tasks and jobs is really helpful for those uh, running businesses or uh, trying to predict the evolution of their workforce models and seeing how technology may tomorrow uh, be changing their workplaces. Now, getting to just the definition of what the gig economy is, we hear so much about the gig economy, the sharing economy, uh, the contingent workforce, but what really is the difference? Um, the slide here shows that there really is a broad group of workers who have always been around um, as part of the contingent workforce. That includes temporary workers, independent contractors, consultants, and just generally speaking, the contingent workforce uh, really covers non-employee workers that businesses have been employing for you know, decades. Um, the gig economy really is a subset of the contingent workforce that is the overlap with the sharing economy. And when we talk about the sharing economy, what we're referring to is the, uh, I guess, technology-enabled uh, advance of the use of otherwise underlying assets. And what I mean by that is thinking to the examples that we're all familiar with, the Ubers, the, the individual who has a car and can give rides uh, during certain hours when he has nothing better to do, or the homeowner that has a rental vacant property that uh, listed on Airbnb. But the sharing economy, when it's providing labor, uh, is what we actually call the gig economy. Now. With so much change in the workplace, we've definitely be, been seeing a uh, new wave of workers who are welcoming on-demand opportunities in the gig economy. Uh, these are workers who uh, uh, enjoy not being tied down to a traditional nine-to-five nine job, uh, don't necessarily need a steady salary, uh, and disfavor office-type jobs uh, that uh, in exchange provide them the 
sense of ownership, a sense of freedom uh, to be able to uh, really be their own boss. Now, one o overriding concern that we'd like to touch on today is whether this change for workers who are in the on-demand economy and uh, work in gig economy jobs is whether the change is good for the workers who are embracing it. Uh, yes, they derive freedom in their daily pursuits, but uh, what do they give up in terms of security that comes with traditional jobs? Uh, at the same time, from the employer perspective, uh, given employees are demanding this flexibility, uh, for employers who are trying to accommodate the evolving workforce, what risks do they take on as they try to evolve in this legal and regulatory framework that uh, really never contemplated the gig economy? One thing that I'd like to note is that increased attention and scrutiny of gig economy jobs and workers means that there's also increased scrutiny of other types of traditional work, contingent workforce um, that I referenced earlier. Uh, because of legal and regulatory issues that impact gig economy workers uh, uh, also impact uh, more traditional independent contractors, um, changes that are implemented and on the horizon in response to the gig economy also will have a profound impact on those uh, more traditional temporary workers, independent contractors, and consultants. So even if you're not in the gig economy, the issues presented by the future workforce and uh, the evolving gig economy uh, actually impact uh, these other non-traditional worker relationships. So even if you're not a burger joint that's fully automating, if you're a company that receives services from an independent company's employees, like uh, those in a franchise or franchisee relationship, or if you have clients uh, of staffing companies, or companies that just outsource non-core functions to uh, more discrete contracting companies, uh, the legal issues that we'll get to uh, uh, in connection with the gig economy really also do come to play uh, for those other non-traditional or non-employee working relationships. We can go to the next slide. So just looking at some of the numbers and why this is of so much importance now, uh, just asking the question where the gig economy is headed, uh, while many things are up for debate, uh, it really is certain that it's going up. Uh, numerous studies have looked at uh, the contingent workforce uh, more broadly and the gig economy, but uh, all generally come to the conclusion that it's growing, as is interest in its size and scope. Uh, there's a couple bullet points on several studies on the slide, but uh, even before then, in uh, April of 2015, uh, the U.S. Government Accountability Office itself estimated that 40% of the U.S. workforce was comprised of uh, alternative workers or workers in that more general contingent workforce category. Um, even when you just narrow down and focus in on the gig economy, um, according to Time, a more recent study suggested that there's at least 14 million workers uh, with fast growth expected. Uh, at Kevin and my firm, we actually uh, sent out a future employer survey where we received responses from approximately 700 business stakeholders and the response was overwhelmingly consistent that uh, the, there was really no doubt that uh, change was coming to uh, traditional employee-employer relationships. Moving along to the next slide, I don't need to bore you with the numbers. Uh, but Simon, can I, can, I, can I add just one thing on the prior slide, Simon? Um, just one thing on the direction of the gig economy. A lot of folks who, who track this subject will will know that there was a recent BLS study that was released that suggested some stagnation in the growth of the gig economy. I believe that BLS study is focused on data that's about a year old and, and compared to where it was over the prior several year study, uh, it showed some, some flatness to the growth of the gig economy. I think one really important thing, just my own personal view on that study that's really important to keep in mind is that what that study was focused on is, is folks who, I, who, who could be considered part of the gig economy, so freelancers, contractors, that sort of thing, whose primary income, main income, is through those types of jobs. It did not pick up 
folks whose primary income or main source of income is maybe from a W-2 type job, but also pick up, you know, an Uber ride or a Lyft ride or a you know, task through task rabbit, that sort of thing, which you know, I don't personally have you know, numbers on how, how, you know, how many folks would fit into that bucket. But certainly anecdotally from you know, the stories we've all heard driving in an Uber or a Lyft or using some sort of app to get a task done, there's many, many folks out there who would fit into that bucket who aren't primarily doing that type of work, but who are definitely part of that gig economy. So I think that's an important piece to keep in mind in looking at the BLS study in particular, is this question of you know, how much of this, this piece of the gig economy did it actually capture? Good point, Kevin. Um, I uh, wanna make sure that we stay on track and get through all the material. So uh, uh, I uh, didn't wanna bore everyone with the numbers, but you know, just <laughs> Fair enough. Again, generally covering the benefits of the on-demand economy from both the perspective of employees and employers. Uh, we've already touched on it, but one of the most obvious benefits for contingent work from the employee perspective is that freedom from the traditional workplace's requirements, whether that's uh, set schedules and hours of work or fixed hourly rates of compensation. Uh, or even just an inability to uh, simultaneously compete uh, in the marketplace by working for uh, other entities. Uh, studies have shown that those are really the flexibility uh, and freedom that on-demand workers are demanding uh, now and in the future. Uh, when considering the benefits though, uh, you know, taking a broader lens and looking at the advantages that just general independent contractor sites also come into play. Um, there are benefits that uh, previous studies have shown that uh, workers who uh, prefer to be on a 1099 basis like having an enforceable written contract. Uh, they, uh, in some cases, prize the fact that they might have intellectual property that they can keep. Um, just from a financial perspective, there's certainly uh, business-related tax deductions that come into play, um, and ultimately. Uh, th th there's a host of reasons why uh, and we anticipate that workers continually are going to want the, uh, the, the freedom of not necessarily being a W-2 employee. Uh, from the employer perspective, though, there also are certain benefits. I mean, one of the biggest draws for a business uh, to consider using uh, either gig economy type jobs or just other uh, non-employee working relationships is the ability for it to focus on its core competencies. And what we mean by that can be seen in the example of uh, the uh, uh, holes that the Grubhubs and the Uber Eats uh, are, are serving where, uh, for example, a restaurant can be free to be a restaurant and focus on its core competency of making food. Um, in order to serve the delivery market. It doesn't need to develop the skills or the workforce to be able to deliver that food. The on-demand and gig economy uh, fills that hole. More broadly, this thinking applies to any business, where any business has a opportunity to increase its efficiency by outsourcing to gig economy workers or other independent contractor setups. These ancillary services um, you know, there's there's potential businesses or there's potential uh, uh, efficiencies for the business uh, by considering these options in the future. Um, of course, there are also risks that businesses have to face, and that is where a lot of the current legal focus is on. But when you look at the risk, not to gloss over the worker side, there's definitely a host of risks that workers who prefer gig economy and flexible relationships face. I mean, most importantly, or I guess not most importantly, but uh, 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 one of the most important is the lack of employment-based benefits, that safety net. Um, employees who traditionally find themselves eligible for workers' compensation, for example, or contributing to their social security uh, uh, benefit entitlements don't have that as 1099 employees or as gig economy employees. Um, 
because there is less of an existing ongoing relationship for the workers and the uh, business, there's also a reduced opportunity to uh, uh, have the business invest in the worker to develop the skills or to have training. And of course, there's a head-on collision with what we were talking about at the beginning with automation and robots. And what I mean by that is that question that I just presented for businesses who are trying to really maximize their efficiencies and hone in on their core competencies. One solution is to look to gig economy workers. Another solution that's becoming uh, increasingly uh, possible is uh, figuring out ways to automate those tasks entirely. Um, looking from the employer perspective, though, one of the significant risks is the fact that businesses have all sorts of consumer risks that they're probably going to be on the hook for. And what, what I mean by consumer risk is uh, uh, demonstrated by a couple of examples. Uh, if there is a driverless car, who, who ends up being liable for a driverless car accident? Is it the manufacturer, the owner, the passenger? Um, there's that type of risk, but there's also a risk that is being hotly litigated for a lot of the startup on-demand companies that we, we probably see in the media now. And one of those, that, that specific risk is the risk of uh, having the decision to classify employees in the gig economy as independent contractors uh, being challenged. Um, when, you, when you step back and ask yourself why this is such a uh, hot topic, um, there's a huge potential exposure that businesses take on for misclassifying independent contractors uh, as employees. So when we get to discussing some of these legal risks, you'll see that a lot of the case studies are actually of uh, litigations that are challenging, whether that initial classification as an independent contractor or uh, employee uh, was proper in the first place. So that brings us right into the main uh, risk that we're talking about from the employment side. As, as Simon laid out on the prior slides, the risks are multifaceted for both employees and employers who choose to chart this course with gig economy type jobs. And so too are the benefits. And you know, the benefits are multifaceted, and but, but there's risks as well. We wanted to talk really about, about the legal risks that Simon was just hitting at so much of which center on potential misclassification. Misclassification, many folks, when they hear about it, they think primarily of you know, misclassification for wage purposes. You know, we, we've classified them as an employee who's entitled to minimum wage and overtime versus an independent contractor who is not entitled to those things. But really, misclassification is multifaceted. There's certainly wage laws that demand a classification of a given worker. But there's also a range of other uh, legislation, both at the state and federal levels, that depend on what a person's classification is. Everything from workers' compensation to the rights to organize under the uh, rights provided by the NLRA, uh, you know, tax treatment and withholdings, things of that nature, um, all sorts of you know, you know, employee benefits that aren't provided or, or, or required for independent contractors. That's sort of thing. So it's not just a wage question, but it's a question that, that, that calls into question, calls into focus so many different areas of the law that look at you know, what is this relationship between the business and the worker. The, the, the real, you know, the friction that we've got here, uh, for anyone who has time, I, I generally do not make a practice of recommending that folks go read legal opinions during a webinar. But if you do have a second to just Google the Grubhub opinion from California by Judge uh, Jacqueline St Scott Corley, um, it was issued earlier this year. And it was the first case I know of and the first case that's really reported to have gone to trial on the classification of a worker uh, within the gig economy. So it was for a Grubhub driver. We'll talk a little bit more about it. But within the decision in which Judge Corley is 
kind of throwing her hands up saying, look, you know, I think this is an independent contractor based on everything that's that, that's been given to me. It's, it's certainly not an employee under California law. You've got Judge Corley also making this plea to the California legislature saying, look, you know, it, this can't be it. You know, this person isn't neatly an employee, but they also don't really feel like an independent contractor. And, and my decision on this is going to lead to all of these sorts of benefits either being provided or not being provided with no real middle ground. But that's the way that most of the laws in this area work is, is that you know, there's independent contractor, there's employee, and that's pretty much it. There's you know, no third classification yet under the main employment laws. There's no dependent contractor. Uh, we hear it talked about as like a third rail type of uh, relationship. There's nothing like that. It's kind of one or the other. And when you add on top of that, the fact that so many of these laws were written for a different time, it really introduces complication that can cause both employers and their lawyers, but you, me and Simon, to kind of throw your hands up and, and, and say, you know, we're kind of doing the best we can, but but it's not really a neat application. You know, one thing that, that, that I talk about a lot in, in, in making that point is the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is you know, the, the threshold wage and hour litigation, federal legislation born out of the Great Depression, part of the New Deal. And if you go back to the workplace of that time, when the FLSA was, was first enacted, that is a very different workplace. You know, the idea of, of a Grubhub driver who could be, you know, to choose to work for 45 minutes on Monday and not work for the next five days and then work five hours the day after that, you know, in, in mesh shorts and a t-shirt or in a suit, whatever they might want to do, was not even, you know, near the imagination at that point in time. When you look at that legislation, when it talks about defining work, the regulations talk about the work day as being whistle to whistle. I, I don't know a job outside of the, 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 the you know, transportation and rail industries that still have a whistle to start the work day and end the work day or anything close to it. So you've got laws like that. The FLSA is just one example that not only do they not really recognize this kind of third category of work that's not you know, hyper controlled, but also not completely independent, but in addition, in applying these two rigid types of classifications, you've got old laws that just don't really speak to the workplace of today and haven't caught up. Um, you know, there's a few examples of that. So you know, the FLSA, in looking at whether somebody is an employee or an independent contractor, looks at the economic realities of, of the relationship. And there's several factors that go into that. They look at, you know, is the work that's being performed integral to the employer's business? This is where you hear a lot of debate on whether, you know, are these you know, the quintessential gig companies of the world, the Ubers, the Lyfts, are they technology companies where the driver isn't really providing the integral part of the business or are they transportation companies where the driver arguably is? That's a, one of several factors that you look at under that economic realities test. You also look at, you know, for the worker, um, what kind of opportunity for profit and loss do they have? Good example is, you know, the painter who, you know, you hire the painter, you say, I don't, I just want my red wall to be turned blue. And whether you do it over a day and a half or two days, whether you bring you know, two folks to help you or three or do it yourself, these things don't matter so, so much to me. I just want my, my, my red wall to be turned blue or vice versa. It, that painter has the opportunity for profit and loss in terms of how they get the job done. It's very outcome driven. So that's another factor. Does the worker have that type of opportunity? Uh, you look at you know, what's the worker's investment in the job, um, what types of special skill is required, um, and, and above all else, you know, in, in, in any test that we look at, whether it's this economic realities test or different tests that are used for employment purposes under the tax code or workers' comp laws, is this factor of control. You know, how much does does the business control over what that given worker is doing? But nevertheless, you know, I think the important thing to keep in mind here is we're looking at a lot of different factors. No one factor is dispositive. And the way that they've been applied is, and the way that they've been written is just for a different workplace, a different time. That leads to some trends that, that we've been seeing in the courts. Um, you know, whether gig workers are employees or independent contractors, it is a hotly litigated issue. 
and there is very little binding precedent on the issue. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, earlier this year, we got a ruling from a California federal court uh, involving a Grubhub driver that, that the court found after her trial did not meet the criteria to be an employee under California labor law. That's the first federal court that's definitively ruled on the question, and that was under California state law. We haven't seen a ruling on this question under the litany of other employment laws that care about whether somebody is or is not an employee. The Fair Labor Standards Act, the ADA, the FMLA, the, you know, Title VII, all of these statutes, we haven't even had one definitive ruling following a trial for workers in this space. Um, you know, one issue is that in addition to many cases just settling short of really going to the mat, many are resolved through arbitration. And you know, many folks on this call probably know the Supreme Court recently issued a ruling that, that really blesses arbitration agreements that have class or collective action waivers in them. So it would not be unfair to assume that arbitration agreements in this space will become even more common than they were before. Besides that, you know, we've seen definitive but conflicting rulings at the lower levels in state courts. In February of 2017, as it says on the slide, we saw a Florida appellate court who upheld a ruling by the state revenue agency finding that Uber drivers were properly classified as contractors. In June of the same year, we saw a New York ALJ, or an administrative law judge, issued the opposite ruling, saying that the New York Department of Labor uh, ruling that Uber drivers were employees was was correct. Um, this Grubhub trial, as I mentioned, is is I think an opinion that's that's worth googling and just checking out. Certainly for the fact that it's got the judge who's kind of laying out this this kind of square peg round hole phenomenon, comparing what the work relationship is to what the laws say. But it's also important to look at you know one concern that I know that Simon and I have talked about is that businesses in this space will see, well, okay, we got a Grubhub decision that says a gig economy worker can be classified as a contractor. And that's not what it says. As you would imagine, it's a very fact-sensitive ruling. And in going through the opinion, Judge Corley, Judge Corley lays out the fact that Grubhub was a very hands-off business, and that's what really led to the decision that the company secured. Uh, you know, it, for example, the the Grubhub driver didn't have any required shifts. He could work as much or as little as he wanted, when he wanted, for how long he wanted. If he disappeared for several months, that was pretty much okay. And if he came back on for seven hours, that was okay too. There was no uniform. Uh, there wasn't even a requirement that he drive a car. If he wanted to use a bike, that would have been okay. And the, the training that Grubhub provided you know, they certainly gave him minimal training to know how to receive an order and deliver it, that sort of thing. But it wasn't much more than that. Certainly not what most businesses expect when they bring an employee in and get to put them through orientation on company culture and reporting issues and safety concerns and reimbursement and all these things that are so customary to the start of an employment relationship. So Grubhub's important because it was a good result for Grubhub. It's important because you know, it, it, it's definitive in, in ruling on this question that hasn't been ruled upon by another federal court. But I think it's also important for the fact that you know, it, it lays out facts that fit the bill in that case that not every business is gonna have in this space. We can go to the next slide. So this slide kind of speaks for itself, and, and this is something that Simon was alluding to before, but, but the, consequence, the consequences of misclassification are very real in this space from a legal perspective. As the gig economy expands and grows and stretches out, the number of lawsuits alleging misclassification in this space is on the rise. They are usually, uh, the majority of the time, alleged as class action lawsuits, so we're not seeing you know, one person say, well, I was misclassified and I want to recover my money. We're seeing them say, I was misclassified and I represent all other drivers who've worked for you over the past three years or all other handymen who were part of this app and, 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 and part of this network and I represent all of them. Um, that, reads, that leads to real leverage in the lawsuits that are filed and you can see that in the settlements that we've got uh, listed here. Um, you know, for FedEx, they had the number one uh, published settlement 
in 2017 and 2016, comprising almost half a billion dollars between those two. Um, we've got you know, certainly Uber, uh, a, a well-publicized settlement in 2016 that was up to $100 million for just two states in California and Massachusetts, and then Lyft, and, which was last year, a $27 million settlement with California drivers alone. Um, you know, these are well-publicized well publicized, uh, settlements, and they really illustrate the risk. It's the risk that not just one worker is going to say, I was misclassified for purposes of wage law or whatever, whatever you know, law they're going to place at issue, but it's this risk of a flood of litigation, whether through a class case or through a string of arbitrations or something like that. Go to the next slide. As Simon was alluding to also, the consequences here, it's not just the misclassification uh, you know, wage case sort of sort of uh, risk that we were talking about before. Um, you know, even, even when you have a business that doesn't really contract with gig economy workers itself, those that contract with other businesses that do, still can be at risk for potential liability, including through joint employer liability. Certainly over the last four or five years, we've seen an expansion or, or loosening, I should say, of the standards required to find that two businesses rather than one jointly employed a given worker. That's started to change a little bit, at least at the agency level. We've seen the US Department of Labor walk back some of its announcements or pronouncements from the prior administration about when and where joint employment can be found. But nevertheless, this is a trend that kind of predated uh, this administration, and it didn't just take place at the agency level. We've seen courts, uh, judges, really broadening and expanding the definition of who can be found to be a joint employer. So as Simon was mentioning at the outset, you know, the risks that, that, that come in with misclassification. It's not just the risk of signing up somebody to be your freelancer or contractor or whatever it's going to be to, to engage with this gig economy workforce. It could also be the risk that a business you're working with does that and you are somehow found to be a joint employer. In addition, you know, th th there's all these kind of attendant risks that, that I think about and that lawyers think about and, 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 looking at what does it mean to get it wrong or, or to, to end up in hot water in this space. You know, there are little things that seem little, but, but, but they're not. They, they lead to real issues. You know, FMLA eligibility is listed here. You know, FMLA eligibility looks at has the, the worker uh, been with the employer for you know, 1,250 hours for in the 12 months prior to seeking the leave. And that looks at, you know, were they an employee? And, and if you've got a business who's saying, no, they were not, but then you have a case saying, well, yes, I was, you know, I, I performed well over that and you just didn't have me classified as, a, as an employee. You know, th there's certainly risk in that space. And then you could just go down the list. You know, is someone entitled to workers comp? Do they have the right to collectively bargain? Um, you know, what kind of retirement benefits, if any, are you extending to them? If you extend it to employees, but not to contractors, which is typically the case, then you, does someone have the leg to stand on to say, well, I should have been included is an employee, you just have to be misclassified for this purpose. We can go to the next slide. And I'll throw it back to Simon just to talk about some of the trends we're seeing at the legislative level um, and, and, and trying to address these trends that we're talking about. Thanks, Kevin. And just to, I guess, summarize an important takeaway from those on the business side from what Kevin was saying, um, you know, it, it's really important uh, to understand that, you know, Kevin talked about the Grubhub as the example, but the decision is a good read, not because it only discusses the actual facts that the court considered in weighing independent contractor employee status, but putting that together with uh, what was mentioned at the bottom of one of the slides in terms of the fact that uh, two different states came to a different conclusion when considering the same set of facts for two different Uber drivers, uh, one concluding that one was an employee and another concluding uh, that the driver was an independent contractor, which 
is just to highlight the fact that inside your own businesses, you really have to understand where uh, the business might be exerting control over uh, individuals that it is working with on a 1099 basis because it's those types of control that could be used against the company uh, in any litigation that it faces. And again, th this creates a, 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 a tension uh, when you juxtapose it with some of the other risks that uh, businesses face. Uh, for example, we talked about the consumer risk where an employer obviously, uh, not an employer, a business uh, certainly has a, a consideration for wanting to minimize its potential consumer side risk for accidents or individuals that uh, it is hired um, to work with. But that's directly at odds with the control type factors that uh, become relevant in the employee independent contractor classification context. Now, given how difficult, as Kevin mentioned, uh, uh, some of these working relationships uh, 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 end up uh, being in terms of proper classification as you know, uh, square pegs for round holes, there are trends among lawmakers to uh, try to help give businesses more certainty. Um, I'm going to ask that we skip over this slide because we can discuss it in connection with uh, an upcoming slide and want to make sure that we keep uh, on track, but these trends that we see among lawmakers in proposed bills are coming up in all sorts of different contexts. Uh, it, at the federal level, we've seen certain bills being proposed, but it's really the state level or even the city or county level where you see uh, new exciting ideas not only making it to a proposed legislation state but actually being enacted. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, the, the judge in the Grubhub decision had made this plea to the legislature to uh, get involved, but when you think about the different types of potential laws being discussed, they have ranging uh, uh, topics that they seek to uh, provide business certainty on. Uh, one is whether these independent contractors actually have any uh, traditional union-like right to organize. Uh, you know, clearly, as Kevin mentioned, due to the high exposure that some of these misclassification litigations uh, present, you know, classifications for wage purposes or tax purposes are also at issue. But going on, uh, to the next slide, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that we stay on track um, and have some time for questions. Going back to the federal level, uh, you know, businesses can take some solace from the fact that there at least seems to be a decreased uh, uh, federal agenda in terms of uh, uh, finding independent contractor or joint employer liability for some of these uh, independent contractor working relationships. In the prior administration, there had been a DOL advice memorandum that pretty much said that uh, uh, most workers would be found to be employees, not independent contractors. But in June of last year, the DOL withdrew that guidance, which is a uh, uh, which provides a sigh of relief for a lot of businesses, but doesn't necessarily provide them the uh, uh, standard that will apply going forward. Uh, in the legislature, the House of Representatives in November approved the Save Local Business Act um, legislation, which uh, uh, was trying to address joint employer standards to, to uh, give businesses some sort of assurance that they wouldn't necessarily be found uh, liable for joint employer liability uh, in, a, in a very broad, broad perspective. And in December the following month, the NLRB, which had had a very expansive interpretation of its joint employer uh, test, uh, withdrew a decision that, uh, again, emphasized how much direct control a business had over a worker, although that decision earlier this year uh, was, again, uh, uh, reversed by the NLRB. There's a number of other proposals that are on deck currently and being considered for uh, federal workplace laws, although this time, as I mentioned earlier, uh, most of the action is actually occurring at the state or even city or local uh, uh, 
municipal ordinance level. Uh, Kevin's going to talk about those in in, in just a second, but uh, you know another point that I just want to mention as a very general takeaway is that uh, there is probably going to be a patchwork of different standards that apply to uh, on-demand and uh, non-traditional employee, non-traditional uh, worker relationships going forward. So it really does put the onus on uh, you know, the HR professionals internally in businesses uh, or, or uh, business owners to, to be mindful of the changing standards so that they can proactively address uh, uh, whatever laws are going to apply to them. Uh, next slide. Okay, so so as Simon mentioned, you know, in, in addition to seeing some movement or some 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 thought and 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 looking at proposed legislation at the federal level, we're seeing even more at, at the state level, uh, at least in certain uh, in, in in certain states. Um, one type of proposal we've seen a little bit so far is this independent contractor with benefits idea, uh, sometimes uh, correlated with the portable benefits, quote unquote idea, this idea of portable benefits, that essentially uh, where it's been proposed is said that you can have th this kind of independent hands-off work relationship, but you're going to have the contracting uh, business pay into a sort of benefits fund, something that can be used to provide the types of benefits that W-2 employees have that can be taken with that worker or, or by that worker wherever they may go. So it's not tied to them having the same job day in and day out. Um, we've seen you know, in, in February, of, it wasn't last, it was last year, not this year, so February 2017 uh, in Washington State, uh, we saw a portable benefits bill uh, that, that, was, that was proposed and was really kind of a, a groundbreaker of its kind. Um, that one, like I just described, had the contracting agencies, sorry, the contracting agents so the businesses who are using this source of work, uh, buying in and, and paying into this fund that could be used uh, to the benefit of the workers, whether for workers' comp type of benefits or for other types of benefits like health insurance, paid leave, retirement, that sort of thing. Uh, we saw a similar proposal in New Jersey last year, and we've seen similar legislation proposed in California and New York more recently. Um, another type of legislation we're seeing to try to fill the gap at the state level is this independent contractor with organizing rights idea. Uh, the, the, the most notable example of this was in Seattle, Washington. There was a bill that, that just like, or sorry, an ordinance at, at the Seattle level that exactly like what it sounds, it says independent contractors you know, have a right to organize and to collectively bargain uh, just like an employee would. That bill or that ordinance hit a, a major roadblock right out the gates, but is, I think it was earlier this year that the Ninth Circuit came in and, and, and removed that roadblock and said that the law that was previously found to be preempted by the NLRA was in fact not preempted. And finally, we've got Arizona who's, who's enacted this exemption that essentially, and, and I'm really paraphrasing at a high level here, essentially allows in certain types of businesses and in, in, in gig type businesses where it's really you know, the business has a digital uh, you know, presence and that's their main presence and they're working with drivers, whatever the case may be. It says certain businesses in that space can opt in both sides, the worker and the business and say from the outset, this is an independent contractor relationship and it gives a rebuttable pr presumption to businesses in that space that you know, if at the outset, everybody is saying voluntarily, you know, we're in this space, we fit the requirements, and we all agree that, that it should be treated like this, it gives the, the business some cover if that classification is later challenged. Um, next slide. So I, I won't harp on these. You know, all of this presents challenges and opportunities um, for businesses, and I think we've really covered or, or at least touched on them as we've gone uh, throughout this presentation today. Um, you know, some of the challenges is, is you know, would certainly include looking like the type of business that this wave of gig economy workers want to work with, you know, providing opportunities that they find attractive. Um, you know, certainly a challenge is, is finding ways to do that without letting go of the brand and, and you know, letting you know, who aren't 
as invested as your main W-2 employee to have some control over your brand, that's a tough proposition. And it's something that's going to you know, certainly require some thought. Um, but as Simon mentioned early on, there's opportunities here as well. And there's opportunities to really get you know, workers with the skills you need in through the door, working with your business on a short-term or temporary type basis in a way that's really mutual, mutually beneficial to both sides. Well, thank you, Kevin and Simon. Um, before we get into everyone's questions, because I know time is wrapping up, um, I just wanted to spend one minute on ePay and talk through what Kevin and Simon talked about today, in particular, how to stay in compliance when you're working with a gig workforce. So staying in compliance with state and federal laws while employing a gig workforce can have its pitfalls, obviously. Um, eBay helps you stay in compliance with our built-in compliance safeguards to ensure that you're in line with the latest federal and state wage and hour rules. We help you reduce compliance risk associated with the hiring of new employees with automated federal and state tax and employment verification forms, so your I-9s. We also help you effectively manage your ACA, OSHA, EEO, FLSA, COBRA, and workers' comp compensation. With our system, you get accurate insight into employee activity for training and development, OSHA, and other HR activities and events. You can also easily build and leverage reports to make critical decisions, identify trends, recognize trouble spots, and gather the employee data needed to analyze your company's compliance. And finally, the system helps you unify pay practices and rates uh, to ensure compliance across your organization. And we do this all through um, our end-to-end -end human capital management solution that includes applicant tracking, HR management, benefits admin, time and attendance, payroll and tax management, and performance management, specifically created for the distributed gig workforce. So let's take a few questions if we still have time. Um, Kevin and Simon, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Thanks. I actually think that we're out of time, and Kevin and I will uh, answer questions offline. Apologies that uh, we ran a little long, but just as a summary, uh, we obviously want to thank you for uh, your time and attendance today. Um, but again, if, if the takeaway wasn't clear, um, you know, we really do anticipate. A, a growth in this type of work, which means an attendant growth in the risk that it presents. And given that the future trend is that state and local ordinances are really how some of these issues are going to be addressed, it, it really does uh, 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 benefit to uh, make sure, whether it's through EPA or otherwise, uh, uh, that you have uh, uh, at least focused attention on compliance with the different state and local requirements that your workforce may require. Perfect. So um, all I request is that everyone, um, as you guys are signing off, please take the survey. Um, in the survey, it will ask if um, you'd like a quick two-minute tour. Um, and we can also uh, set you up with a customized ePay, HCM, or TLM demo. So thank you, everyone. Well, I'd like to thank uh, you, Brittany, as well as Kevin and Simon. And as Simon had mentioned, uh, I'll make sure that uh, they receive all the questions so they uh, they may be answered offline. So uh, don't worry about that. We will get a response to you. So this does conclude our webcast. And just a reminder that uh, this webcast will be available in HR.com archives for up to seven days for our free members and without restrictions for those with the certification membership. Your webcast credits are stored in your HR.com account, and we will also be sending you at the credit information in an email. Your feedback is very important to us, so do please take a couple of moments to fill out the exit survey that will appear on your screen once this room has closed. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day.